Well, good evening. How are we all feeling tonight? Good. I am actually, I don't know if you can tell by my voice, I, I've been pretty sick over about the past four or five days um, and I was feeling fantastic when I uh, got up this morning. I thought, yes, awesome, God, you, you, you know, you're healing me and, and I'm getting better and I'm going to be fully prepared to speak tonight. And as, as the day went on, um, and especially over the past two hours, I've just kind of felt like I've been getting heavier and heavier and my head started to, to hurt and my throat started to hurt. And I was down the back um, kind of saying, God, why is this happening? Like, I'm, I'm wanting to, to speak. This is my first time speaking. And um, why am I getting sicker? You know, why is this seeming to be harder? And God just kind of said to me, I, I felt um, in my spirit that God was saying um, that my, my grace is sufficient for you. Uh, my power is sufficient for you. Um, and so with that, um, tonight I am going to be speaking on the ever so popular and fun topic of adultery. Or not so much adultery, like how not to do it, more than, anyway. Um, so... <laughs> Anyway, so my name is Darren. I'll tell you a little bit about myself. My name is Darren Porter, um, and I work here part-time at the church as the night service music director. Um, I also have another part-time job doing bucket drumming in primary schools with the kids. I love it. It's heaps of fun, and that's probably actually why I've got the headache um, with all that bucket drumming. Um, and I, um, I play most of these instruments that you'll see behind me throughout the year if you come to night service you may see me kind of bouncing around uh, filling in gaps and doing that I also love drama and acting um, and so it was a no-brainer for the lead team when they were deciding who was going to speak on what they kind of got to to this one and I thought okay Darren he's got the music and the drama and all this stuff so let's stick him on adultery and I was like Yep, okay, sounds good. Um, I thought it was going to be a relatively easy topic to speak on. Turns out um, it's actually quite a difficult topic to write about. Um, and so uh, my family, uh, my wife and I went on holiday for uh, a day or two at a Hopi with my parents and some family friends. And I knew this was coming up and I said to my parents, what, what do I need to say like, how do I start a sermon on adultery? And um, my dad was cooking um, on the barbecue. He turns around and goes, oh, just something like this. Adultery. Don't do it. And, um, and I thought, yeah, okay. Um, but th that's a good start. But it may need to be a little bit more than that. So thanks for your advice, Dad. Always helpful. Um, and it was a fantastic place to start. Um, <clears throat> So let's just start uh, this evening now in prayer, as this is a, an interesting topic, um, and I just want to pray for, for God's wisdom right now. So, yes. Heavenly Father, I just, I really want to bring this, this topic, this talk uh, before you tonight, Father. Um, I pray that you would um, gently minister to our souls tonight. Uh, to our hearts and also to our brains and who we are, Father. It's, this is something that may not outrightly affect us um, day to day, but there are parts of this topic that do have an impact on our lives, um, no matter who we are, um, due to the choices that we make and the things that we think, Father. So I pray tonight as we, as we learn more about this um, and kind of delve a little deeper into it, Lord, that you would um, you would gently um, take us through it and um, at the end of this um, message Father I pray that that everybody's hearts would be really open to to hear what you have to say about this message Father so be with us tonight speak to us guide us with your spirit in Jesus name amen and I may be drinking a little bit tonight because I get massive cotton mouth when I speak in front of people I can sing to whoever, but as soon as I speak, I clam up, so excuse the water. <clears throat> so over this series, we are looking at um, God's Ten Commandments. 
Um, they are God's, not God's 10 suggestions or God's top 10 hints or cheats for life. They are his commandments. And uh, we are looking at them in reverse order, as uh, Monica said. Uh, we had Pastor Craig talking about the coveting, um, Sean Embling speaking on uh, lying, and last week we had Pastor Ross teaching on stealing, and that was some amazing things that I'd never thought about in my life. This series has just been really impacting um, for me. Um, and, and Pastor Ross, kind of, I said he was teaching on stealing, but he wasn't teaching us how to steal. He was teaching us on the different ways um, that, we, that we do steal. And now we're looking at adultery, or how not to. Um, so I thought I'd kind of start this with a bit of a story. Uh, funny story, I, I, I watch different people speaking, and funny story never goes amiss. Well, I think it's funny anyway. Um, so there was one Mother's Day, uh, and a bishop was visiting one of his churches. Uh, and the minister of that particular church was giving a sermon. He began his sermon by saying, I spent the best years of my life in the arms of another man's wife. Pause. My father's wife. Wink. And everyone in the congregation went, oh, wow, that was so cool. And the bishop, he goes, whoa, that was really good. You know, I'm going to use that tonight when I go and speak at one of the other churches. I'm going to start my sermon by using that illustration. So um, in the evening, he begins his sermon. I spent the best years of my life in the arms of another man's wife. Pause. And he let it sink in for quite some time. And he let it sink in a little longer and a little longer. Unfortunately, he had had a mind blink. And all he could do to finish was, and I just can't remember who. <laughs> yeah, I thought that was a pretty good one too. Um, you see, um, some people think that the seventh commandment reads, thou shalt not admit adultery, when in fact it's all about committing the act itself. There once was a man who was convinced his wife was having an affair. So he left work early one day so he could arrive back at his apartment block and hopefully catch his wife and this other man uh, in the middle of their affair. He took the elevator up to the eighth floor where he lived and inside his house he could smell the faint scent of cigar smoke and cheap cologne. The rage started to build up inside him and he burst through the door and began searching high and low for this man who he thought was in the house. He looked in the bedrooms, under the bed, in the closet, there was no one there. He looked in the kitchen, in the pantry, in all the cupboards, there was no one in there. In the lounge, behind the couches, there was no one there. And he kind of sat down looking confused and his wife was just standing awkwardly in the corner of the room watching him. And suddenly he had a thought, oh, the balcony, I bet he's hiding out on the balcony. So the man quickly rushed out to the balcony, and there was no one there. And he had a look over the balcony, and down on the, on the ground floor, he could see a man was hurriedly getting into a sports car. And this just threw this man into this massive rage. And he was so upset, he thought this man had, had, had escaped him and gotten down. So he went to the kitchen and grabbed the first thing he found, which happened to be the fridge, and pulled it over, pulled it over, right to the edge, and he tossed it over. Now, unfortunately, in his hurry, in his rage, he didn't realize that the cord to the fridge was wrapped around his leg. The fridge goes over, he goes over, fridge hits the car, he hits the fridge, boom, end of scene one. Scene two, the next life. Peter says to the first man at the pearly gates, why should we let you in here? And the man said, I love my wife. I was just trying to save my marriage. I got so carried away and I threw the fridge over and I got caught on my leg and I went over and now I'm here. And Peter was like, whoa, 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 it's okay. It's okay, calm down. We understand about these things. Just have a seat over here. So I'll be with you shortly. And then Peter turns to the second man and says, why should we let you in here? And the second man says, I just got a paper, pulled over, got a paper, hopped back in my car, just started flicking through it, and then boom, a fridge falls on me, and now I'm here. What the heck's up with that? 
And Peter says, okay, it's okay. We understand all about the innocent bystander. It's fine in these situations. You just go take a seat over here and someone will be with you shortly. Peter then turns to the third man and says, what on earth were you doing in a fridge? (laughs) Ah, good. (laughs) Uh, If there's one thing that I have learned um, over my uh, many years of being a Christian, it's this. Um, God knows everything. Okay, there is nothing that we do um, in any part of our life that is hidden from God. We, we might be alone and we do something and there are only two people who know that we did it, ourselves and God. He is always watching and he is always there. And I don't mean that in a kind of scary way, but in some way I do want you to think about that next time you're stealing something or doing something that you shouldn't be doing. God knows everything. And adultery can vary from the casual fling to the intense affair of which films and novels are made. Did you know that the greatest source of sex miseducation uh, in the world is actually on television? Very rarely on television are lovers, a husband and a wife in a marriage relationship. In many films, there is a constant seduction and suggested sexual encounters. And the image makers, the people making the movie, uh, surround it with laughter and with music and uh, sumptuous settings, lovely settings. And it is made to seem very romantic and exciting. But what we don't realize is they actually brush away the deceit, the betrayal, and the ugliness. Sex outside of marriage is like pulling out bricks from the base of a wall. When you do that, the wall eventually will come tumbling down. King David in the Bible is a classic example. He lusted after Bathsheba, and his adultery had driven him to lie, to scheme, to plot, and to murder Bathsheba's husband. David's original little indiscretion, as it would be called by the world standards today, ended up having vast and terrible repercussions. Um, A famous writer, J. John, says in his book that he wrote about the series Just Ten that he has never met anyone who has committed adultery and not lived to regret it. Adultery, even when forgiven, leaves scars. The book of Proverbs teaches us how to live wisely. And there are 31 chapters in Proverbs. Chapters 4 to 7 are all about adultery. Listen to what it says. Can a man scoop fire into his lap and not be burnt? So it is with a man who sleeps with another man's wife. Playing with adultery is playing with fire. And again, Proverbs says, whoever commits adultery is an utter fool, for they destroy their own soul. Adultery hurts, it shatters trust, and it severs friendship. Marriage is about giving, while adultery is about taking for yourself. Adultery denies love, degrades people, destroys families, defiles marriage, and defies God. Now, I'm just going to stop here and just explain very quickly what adultery is, because I realized I haven't done that. Um, So if you're not sure what adultery is, um, within a marriage, if you have two married couples, or even one married couple, and one person from that um, marriage decides to go and sleep with someone else, that is adultery, okay? And it's classed in the Bible as uh, in the confines of marriage. So if a married person sleeps with someone who is not their husband or wife, So God is saying no to adultery because it is a sin against marriage. Listen to what Jesus said. God made them male and female. A man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. Since they are no longer two but one, let no one separate them, for God has joined them together. 
Adultery breaks into the unity that two people have in marriage. Sadly today, too many people have got sex on the brain, and that's the worst place to have it. But let's get this straight. God is absolutely 100% pro-sex. He's not against it. He doesn't think it's, y- think it's yucky or icky or, uh, you know, those feelings that we had about it when we were younger, like, ugh, sex, gross. And then we got married and we were like, hey, hey, hey. Yeah. And if you're not married, you'll, uh, if you eventually end up getting married, you know what I mean. Um, <clears throat> that was awkward. Um, <laughs> The reason God is pro-sex, okay, is because he invented it. He invented it. If he was against it, he wouldn't have invented it because he is God. It's some pretty simple maths, and yet there have been many times uh, throughout history where people have got that wrong and thought that that sex is something that's kind of icky. It's not. It's great, but as long as it's within the confines of a marriage relationship, then sex is amazing. God invented it, and that's why he is pro Six. Relationships are a bit like a fruit cake. You need a number of ingredients that are very important for building good relationships so that they work. And then it all needs to be mixed in correctly, and then it needs some time in the oven before it is ready. And sex in a marriage relationship is like the icing on the cake. Sadly, these days, so many people are eating the icing all the time, and then they wonder why they are getting sick. So we are aware of what the Bible says and what God has to say about affairs within marriage. But what about those of us who are single or dating or engaged, but yet not yet in a marriage relationship? How does this commandment apply to you? Well, I'm going to share a little bit of my past with you now. Um, I'm not proud of who I was, and by the grace of God, I am here now. And uh, married to the most amazing friend that I could ever ask for. But when I was younger, um, I was looking for, I don't know, uh, my identity, as we all do, who I was, and I was very selfish and I only ever thought about myself. Um, And so it came about that sometime around the age of 17 or 18, I ended up, I ended up sleeping um, with a young girl, well not a young girl, that sounded bad, with a girl who was of age, legal age, but still not my wife. Um, And so, so that happened and I felt terrible about myself because you know I'd grown up in, in, a, in a God-fearing family and I was I promised myself that I was going to save sex till marriage um, as so many young Christians do you know I promised I'd said yes God I want to commit myself to you and to my future wife and I, I don't want to give myself away until that point however I found myself in a situation um, and I was not strong enough to resist the temptation um, so that was like opening up the floodgates for me. Um, and I, I started just not, not so much just sleeping around with lots of people, but I ended up just having these short little relationships with lots of different girls. And, um, and it got to the point where I, was, I, I kind of felt good about myself because I was like, oh, I'm the man and you know, I'm sleeping with this person and hooking up with this person and la-da-da-da-da. Um, But what I didn't realize and what I realize now in hindsight was that it was all about me. It was all about self-gratification. What can I get from this person? It wasn't about me giving, it was about me taking, which I mentioned before. I didn't think about them. I ended up ruining heaps and heaps of friendships and I actually ended up being hated by quite a few people. And I don't use that word lightly. Um, I had people violently angry with me um, and you know parents of people who I'd hurt who um, who would um, write me letters or confront me and I'd just freak out and run away and it was it was really hard because I didn't understand fully at the time the ramifications or the 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 things that I was doing 
to these young girls and the way I was treating them, I didn't realise that um, it was kind of tearing them up and it was all about me. But then I met my wife-to-be, Tina. Um, she had not slept with anyone and so we went out, we got engaged and we got married. End of story, happily ever after. Although it wasn't quite so happily ever after. You see, what I hadn't realised uh, was that until I got, uh, sorry, uh, what I hadn't realised until after I got married was this. My wife had given her whole self to me. Everything that she was, mind, soul, body, she had given to me the day we got married. But I was not able to do the same. I wasn't able to return that um, because I had given so much of myself to these other, these other girls in my life. And every time that I had slept with someone, any time anyone sleeps with someone else who is not their husband or wife, a part of you, a part of your soul gets connected to that person and you're actually giving part of yourself away. And you can't just take that back. Okay, so that's something I really want to stress. If you... Uh, uh, in that situation or you might be thinking about it I don't know but that is something that no one ever really told me or, or put into those kind of words that what you give someone else you can't take back yourself what I hadn't realized was that um, <clears throat> oh, sorry yeah I was not able to do the same in fact what I found myself doing uh, in our marriage in the first few years was I was subconsciously comparing my wife to all the other girls that I had slept with. Now I know that sounds terrible and, and I wish that I could change it but this is just how it is and this is the brutal reality of it all. I, I found myself comparing the way she looked, um, everything about her I could compare to something else because I had, I had um, experienced something else before. And it's a really horrible situation to be in. Um, and what that did in turn was make her feel unloved and unwanted in our marriage relationship. But what I have realized is this. Um, So just before I move on, I, I want to touch on something I didn't have in here. Um, this is getting really intense, but I think it's something that needs to be said. Um, and this is this is the quick subject, quick subject. This is the subject of pornography uh, for guys and for girls. Um, if you are in a marriage relationship and looking at pornography, then you are having an affair with someone who is not your wife. If you are single and looking at pornography, you are, like I said before, you are um, putting images and this person, you're letting this person into your soul and into your life and you're just taking, you're taking, but you will forever be comparing other people to these other people that you've been watching on the screen. Um, and it was something I had to admit to my wife that um, I struggled with and that was heartbreaking for her and we worked through it um, and I, I, I got some help and, um, and, and I, I still really struggle with it. Um, I don't struggle with actually doing it but I struggle with the temptation and the pull when I'm alone to look at stuff on the internet um, and it's really hard for me because I work in a church and I'm like, God, I should be better than this and and yet God restores us if we are willing to come before him and to get on our knees and say to God that, look, I am broken. And this isn't just guys, this is for girls as well. In fact, um, someone was saying just the other day um, that the statistics for men in the church or men in general looking at pornography, and females looking at pornography, females are just under men now. 
It's, it's that close. So it's not just about men. Uh, it's also about women. So this is something that is, is really close to my heart. And this was the first thing I thought about when I got asked to speak on this. And I thought, how can I speak on this? Because it's, it's such a personal thing. And yet, I, I can't say that I've made it through. But I'm persevering through it with God's help, with, with my wife's help. Um, and with my close friends. And, and, and I'm able to, to, to work it through. And there are days that are worse than others. But if you, can, if you are struggling with this, um, just get on your knees before God and, and admit that you can't do it on your own. We can't get over these addictions and things on our own. We need God's help. Yeah. So if you are sleeping with someone outside of marriage, then what you are doing is robbing that person's future husband or wife of having 100% of that person. You're taking um, something, if it's me, I would, I would sleep with someone and I'm taking something away from her future husband. Or if a female sleeps with a guy, you're taking something away from that man's future wife. So this commandment 100% applies to you whether you are married or not. I'd just like to uh, invite the band up now. Um, and this, um, this talk was, was labelled um, how to affair-proof our relationships. And so I thought I would end um, this talk tonight, um, giving, giving us some ways that we can actually hopefully avoid ever getting into this situation and also giving um, some hopefully helpful advice um, if this kind of thing ever arrives. If you are single or dating, try not to be alone together with that person. It sounds simple, um, but so easy it is to find yourself alone with this guy or with this girl and you've got nothing to do and you're just chatting away. One thing leads to another and by the end of it you have no idea how you got as far as you did. So one of the best things you can do to... Uh, prevent yourself from getting into that situation is not put yourself in a position where that could happen. You may find, uh, you may say to yourself that my resolve is strong and I would never do that. That's what I thought. Um, you may find that if you're in that situation you are unable to resist those urges and desires. If you are being pressured into doing something that you don't want to do then please talk to someone you trust to advise you, don't just try and deal with it yourself because that pressure can build and build and build and one of two things will happen, you'll either cave or you'll run and that relationship might be ruined forever. And we don't want to ruin our relationships, we want to work through them. Um, <clears throat> maybe, or maybe you just need to run. Maybe you just need to get out uh, like Joseph did. Um, with Potiphar's wife and she tried to win him over with her womanly ways um, but he just tore out of there just absolutely took off and maybe some of us need to do that if you are married and you're finding yourself tempted please talk to someone about these thoughts and feelings there are people at church who would love to have a chat with you and help you work through what's going on in your marriage um, another thing you could do, see a counsellor or even sign up for Alpha Marriage. Because if you are having these thoughts or these temptations, then there is something wrong. And you need to take it back to the foot of the cross and even go further than just saying, God, I need your help, but seek help from your brothers and sisters at the church. Because that's what we're here to do, help each other. And finally, if you are married and having an affair, right now, well not right now, but right now, please stop. Stop now, okay? Not tomorrow, not next week, not, uh, you know, oh, we'll, we'll sort it out, we'll sort it out. No, stop right now. Because if you decide to leave it, then that thing will grow and grow and grow and it'll get out of your control. Talk to someone about the problems that have caused you to get to this place where you're maybe having an affair in your marriage. And if you feel 
that God could never forgive you for what you have done. Just remember that there is hope. We serve a God who restores. Time and time again in the Bible, we see that people slip up. We're human. People make mistakes. And yet God is not a God of, of wrath and eternal, eternal condemnation. But he's a God who wants to restore us to a right place with him. Even though King David had an affair and murdered someone to cover it up, I'm pretty sure none of us have done that. And if you have, talk to someone. Wow. He murdered to cover up an affair. But we read on that, that David was so broken and he got on his knees before God. Yes, there were consequences to what he had done. But God forgave him and he restored their relationship and restored David to um, his rightful place in God's eyes, a man after his own heart. So let's pray tonight. Dear God, there have been some, it's, it's been pretty deep. Um, and I just pray, Father, that if, if anyone is feeling convicted um, or, or something has been said tonight that has touched someone's heart, Lord, I pray that you would, um, you would show them um, the right path that they need to take in order to sort this out. If it's a single person, Father, put people in their lives who can encourage them. If it's a married person who may be having trouble in this area, Father, please, um, please send your spirit to, to minister to them right now so that this problem can be dealt with now and not further down the track where it, where it will just blow up and annihilate so many lives, Father. Affairs and relationships, God, is such a, it's such a killer. It really is, God. But you are a God who restores. You are a God who, who forgives and who loves us. And the song that the band is going to lead us in, um, it speaks of your love for us and how we love you. So God, please be with us tonight. Be in our, be in our hearts and our prayers and our thoughts and just, just settle. Settle within us. Give us a peace and a calm um, as we, we enter into this time of musical worship with you, Father. So we thank you for for tonight. I thank you for this amazing group of people who have come out here to, to hear what you have to say, Father. Come and fall afresh on us, God.